In this video, we gonna talk about small intestines, large intestines, stomach, liver, and their peritoneal relations. Now, liver is mostly covered by peritoneum, but its bare area or the area nuda is not covered by the peritoneum. Here is the diaphragm. Under the diaphragm, the abdominal surface of the diaphragm is covered by parietal peritoneum. Parietal peritoneum continues over the anterior surface of the liver and forms the coronary ligament, anterior layer of the coronary ligament. Parietal peritoneum also continues from the posterior part of the diaphragm onto the liver, which forms the posterior layer of the coronary ligament. Posterior layer of the coronary ligament. When we uh, explained cross anatomical features of the liver, we talk about these ligaments in detail. So just check with that video. So this is the right coronary ligament, left coronary ligament. This is the falciform ligament. And let's put it here. Here is the stomach. This is the oesophagus. Oesophagus in the upper thoracic cavity runs right to the descending aorta. But as the phagus descends, it courses to the left and when it penetrates to the diaphragm through the oesophageal hiatus, it is around four centimeter left to the aorta and in front of the aorta. And oesophagus here has four narrow wings along its course. One is its beginning at the hypopharynx or the laryngopharynx. Another narrow wing is found when it crosses the arch of aorta. The second, or its third narrow wing is found when it crosses the left primary prongus. And its fourth narrowing is found when it passes through the oesophageal hiatus. Cervical and thoracic parts of the oesophagus are not covered by peritoneum, covered by connective tissue, which is called tunica adventitia. And oesophagus is adhered to the surrounding structures through this connective tissue. Now, down here, you have the abdominal part of the oesophagus, which is intraperitoneal. Stomach is completely intraperitoneal. Here is the lesser curvature. Here is the greater curvature of the stomach. Greater curvature of the stomach is the continuation of the left margin of the oesophagus. Lesser curvature of the stomach is the continuation of the right margin of the stomach. Now, stomach is adhered to the liver through the lesser omentum. Stomach is also adhered to the transverse colon through the greater omentum. So the, the part of the greater omentum between the greater curvature of the stomach and the colon, transverse colon, is called castrocolic ligament. Now let's take this out. And then, look at, this is the large intestine, or the intestinum crassa. Now, large intestines form a loop around the abdominal cavity. Inside the loop of the large intestine, 
we have the small intestines, which has three uh, parts, the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum. The jejunum mostly fills upper left quadrant of the abdomen. The ileum mostly fills the lower right quadrant of the uh, abdomen. Now here you see the terminal ileum, which joins to the large intestine through the ileocecal ostium. Here we have a valve. It's called the ileocecal valve. Ileocecal valve. Inferior to the ileocecal valve, we have the cecum. There is a worm-like structure attached to the Cecum is called vermiform appendix. Let's look at this model here. This is the terminal ileum. Look at here. Here is the ileocecal ostium or the foramen. Around it, you have the ileocecal valve. Inferior to the ileocecal valve is the cecum. And here you have the ostium for vermiform appendix. Appendix means something added. This is the vermiform appendix. Now, here is the, again, cecum. Cecum continues up as the ascending colon. Now there is a right flexure, right colic flexure here, or the hepatic flexure, where ascending colon becomes the transverse colon. Back here, there is the splenic, this is the spleen, splenic flexure, or left colic flexure, where the transverse colon becomes the descending colon. Descending colon continues with the sigmoid colon, which then continues with the rectum. Rectum continues with the anal canal, and the anal canal terminates with the anus, which means circular. Now, the append vermiform appendix is intraperitoneal. Cecum is intraperitoneal. Ascending colon is secondarily retroperitoneal. Transverse colon is intraperitoneal. Descending colon is secondarily retroperitoneal. Sigmoid colon is intraperitoneal. Now, intraperitoneal uh, structures have a meso or the or the uh, meso. In this case, this is the uh, mesocolon or the transverse mesocolon. You see, this is the transverse colon. This is the transverse mesocolon, which connects transverse colon to the uh, posterior abdominal wall. Sigmoid colon has also a meso. It's called the meso. Uh, sigmoid mesocolon. Does ascending colon has meso? Well, sometimes it might have a ascending mesocolon, which is, if it present, is very short. The descending colon might have might have descending mesocolon. If it is present, it is also very short. The Jejunum and ileum are also intraperitoneal. The first part of the duodenum is intraperitoneal, but the second, third, and fourth parts of the duodenum are secondary retroperitoneal. Tail of the pancreas is intraperitoneal, but the rest of the pancreas is retroperitoneal. Now look at here. 
What you see here is the tenya. These are called uh, tenya coli. Well, this tenya is formed by the longitudinal muscle layer. Now, around the esophagus, around the stomach, around the small bowels, the longitudinal muscle layer covers entire of that parts of the intestinal uh, um, structures. But when this longitudinal muscle layer comes around the colon, it does not cover entire of the colon. It becomes three bands. As you see here, one is here. This is the omental tenia. Here you have the uh, tenia libera or the free tenia. And back here you have the mesenteric tenia. So you have the mesenteric tenia, omental tenia, and free tenia. And you see these buckerings here, the seculations. Look at these seculations. These are called haustra. These are the haustra of colon, haustra coli. Well, the length of the tenia is shorter than the length of the colon. So, this buckers the colon and forms these circulations, which are called haustra, haustra coli, these are. And there are also uh, epiploic appendages, which are the fat-filled visceral peritoneal sacs, which attach to the free um, tenia uh, coli. And this is the greater omentum. As you see, it covers the most of the small intestine. It uh, helps the uh, protection of the temp body temperature for the abdominal organs. Also, greater omentum can move toward the infection site and try to limit uh, spread of the infection where it is. And also, now let's take this out and look at the uh, this this posterior surface of this model. Now this is the superior mesenteric artery. It, here is the superior mesenteric artery up here. This is its ileocecal artery, ileocecal artery, with the right colic artery. There is also middle colic artery, but it is not shown on this model. This is the inferior mesenteric artery, which has left colic artery, left colic artery, its ascending branch. This is the superior rectal artery, and this is the sigmoid artery, sigmoid artery. And this is the root of the mesentery, root of the mesentery proper. Now, visceral peritoneum covers the uh, small intestine, the, the genum and ileum, and then attaches small intestines to the posterior abdominal wall. And here is the root of the mesentery. What you see here is the root of the mesentery. Now, this is the uncinate process of the pancreas. Here is the head of the pancreas. Here is the neck of the pancreas. As you see, between the neck and neck of the pancreas and the uncinate process, a notch is formed. This is the pancreatic notch. Through the pancreatic notch, superior mesenteric vein and 
superior mesenteric artery pass through. This is the inferior mesenteric vein. This is the splenic vein. Now, inferior mesenteric vein training the large bowels, join the splenic vein that drains the spleen. Then, superior mesenteric vein draining the small bowels, join the splenic vein and forms the portal hepatic vein. And several other small veins drain also portal hepatic vein, which include left castric vein, right castric vein, side stick vein, which is the vein of the gallbladder, and the paraumbilical vein, originating or, or starting around the umbilicus or the navel.